I believe, help my unbelief. Today's gospel reading for the fourth Sunday of Lent contains one of the most powerful confessions of the human condition in its long relationship with God. I believe, help my disbelief. It is at once a cry of a desperate parent, the cry of a believer who has become impatient with God, the cry of human insufficiency in the face of the divine. It's a collective cry of humanity saying, Lord, what more must I do? The encounter of this exasperated father with Christ and his disciples, who has come to see Jesus and his disciples to heal his possessed son, is placed within a larger context in the Gospel of Mark. Today's reading is taken from chapter 9 of the Gospel of Mark, but it occurs immediately after Jesus' experience and transfiguration on a high mountain. In fact, at the beginning of chapter 9, we're told that six days later, after last Sunday's teaching about the calling of the cross, Mark says six days later, Jesus took three of his disciples, Peter, James, and John, and took them to a high mountain, and there he is transfigured. It seems that the activity of the transfiguration happens in one day. That is to say that Jesus ascends to the, 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 or he goes to the high mountain there with the disciples transfigured. And then as he's walking down from the mountain, he speaks with the three disciples. And then he is greeted by this crowd and the remaining nine disciples that he had left behind. And it's at this moment that we are introduced to our story today. Jesus sees the crowd. In fact, the crowd comes running after him. It's almost as if Jesus is paralleled with Moses descending from Mount Sinai. Moses has just seen God, has received the law from God, and he descends from the presence of God to a world of sin, to a world of rejection, to a world of doubt. And in some sense, Jesus is doing the same thing. He comes down from the high mountain, he sees his remaining disciples having a conversation with the scribes. The scribes are Jewish experts of the law. And he asks the scribes, not the disciples, he says, what are you discussing? And it's at this moment that our gospel reading begins. It's at this moment that someone from the crowd calls out, calls out to Jesus, and he says, help me. He says, I teach her, the daskale. I have brought my son to you who has a mute spirit. And whenever it seizes him, it throws him down. He foams at the mouse, mouth, gnashes his teeth, and becomes rigid. The father says, I have brought him to your disciples. While you were away in the high mountain, I brought him to your disciples. But they were unable to cast out this demon. Help me. Jesus' response is quite forceful, not just to the man, but in particular to the disciples. He says, oh, faithless generation, how long shall I be with you? How long shall I bear with you? Bring the son, bring the child to me. Oh, faithless generation. Apistos is the Greek word. It's important to remember that word because this is the same root word that the father is going to you in his famous cry, I believe, pistevo, help my apistia, help my unbelief. It's a harsh rebuke. It's a rebuke to the disciples. Faithless generation, how long must I be with you? The action now turns from conversation with the scribes and the disciples and the father coming to Jesus. Now Jesus turns to the father and he says, bring the son here. The son is brought over immediately when the son or the demon that is possessing the son sees Jesus. The son is put into convulsions. He falls to the ground, rolls around on the ground, hits his head, gnashing his teeth and starts to foam at the mouth. Most interpreters, when they read this, and even those of us today, when we read this story, we often are, are led to think about, well, maybe this man, this young man has epilepsy and maybe he isn't possessed. Regardless, the story says he is possessed, and regardless of whether he's possessed or whether this is an example, an expression, an interpretation of, a, of a, a, an illness or a malady that the ancient world couldn't quite understand, is not germane to the point. The point here is about faith. We have an ill son 
The disciples have not been able to heal the son, and now Jesus will intervene. But Jesus does something very interesting here. He looks to the father, and he looks at the father, and he asks him a question. He goes, how long has your son been sick? Very interesting. He personalizes this event. He could have snapped his fingers. He could have been like other miracle worlds in the ancient world who had said, okay, let me do my little uh, event here and I'll heal you. But he turns to the Father and personalizes it. It's a reminder of how we have to be personal in our relationships, not just with God, but with others. He asks this Father, how long has he been like this? And he says, he's been like this since his youth. And oftentimes the demon will attack him and throw him to the ground. And sometimes he'll roll into a, a, a fire pit or he'll roll into some water trying to kill, kill my son. And now the father says, please help us. Please help us. If you can, you can do anything. Have compassion on us and help us. And Jesus' response is quite powerful. Sometimes the English translates into the, the Greek, if I can, as if Jesus is questioning the father. The Greek is a bit ambiguous here, whether Jesus is kind of asking the Father, if I can, that's not the point. It's what Jesus says next. He says, anything is possible to him who believes. To the one who believes, anything is possible. And here the Father replies, I believe, help my unbelief. I do believe, Jesus, I do believe, but... I still have unbelief. This short phrase, I believe, help my unbelief, encapsulates so much of the human condition. The challenge that we all face, regardless of the depth of our faith, it is the visceral reaction of a father, of a faithful person who seeks God's love and guidance, but feels imperfect in his or her own faith. The question is, how much faith is enough? Jesus tells us elsewhere, the size of a mustard seed. But it seems as if the father is saying, I do have faith. I'm just not sure if it's enough. I have doubts. I don't want to have doubts, but I have them. But teacher, Vidaskale, teacher, please help me. In Matthew's account of this story, the father falls down on his knees and says, Lord. He addresses Jesus as Lord. Immediately, Jesus responds to the father's cry, and he heals the son. The son convulses, falls down to the ground, and it's as if... People are watching. It's as if the son is dead. Jesus reaches down with his hand, pulls up the son. Is there a little hint here to Jesus' own demise, death, burial, and his raising by the father? Perhaps. But Jesus reaches down, lifts up, lifts up the son so people know that he's not dead and the son is alive. The story ends. The miracle has happened. The father's faith was enough. His son is healed, but it's not over. The event, the miracles happen, but now comes the teaching. This event has been in public. Now Jesus, we are told in the gospel, Jesus takes his disciples and they go into a home. We're not told whose home and we're not specifically told where they are taken to, but he's taken to the home, to a home and there in sort of a classical kind of setting where you have master and student, teacher and disciple, the disciples ask Jesus, why weren't we able to cast out the demon? And Christ's reply is quite poignant. This kind can only be cast out with prayer and fasting. Only with prayer and fasting. And here's the teaching. We had the event, we had the miracle, we have the story. But what's the message? Is it simply a message about Jesus as a miracle worker? No, it's much more than that. It's a message about how one can come to power, to the power of God, how the disciples can participate in God's power through prayer and fasting. In fact, it's really for us, only if we ask God, only if we ask God in a spirit of self-denial, in a spirit of service, in a spirit of humility, can we have the power to carry out such wondrous deeds the disciples had been given power to cast out demons. Four chapters earlier in the Gospel of Mark, Jesus tells the disciples, I will give you the power to cast out demons. In fact, there are instances right after that in the Gospel of Mark where the disciples do cast out demons, but they can't do it here. Why? Were they too prideful? 
Did they not ask for help? Did they not pray? Were they not humble, which is one of the outcomes of fasting? Did they not ask God for help? The father did. The father said, I believe, but then he had a prayer. Help my unbelief. It was a prayer. He asked God for help. Perhaps the disciples had not asked God for help. Our faith is only as strong as our ability to ask for help, to ask for guidance. The father's faith was, as he himself exclaimed, lacking. Yet he did not fail to ask. His prayer, help my unbelief, was sufficient. He prayed. He asked God for help. As we continue to contemplate the movement of Lent towards our Lord's passion, death, burial, and resurrection, may we too be reminded and strengthened not to go about it alone, that prayer and yes, fasting are critical to our daily life. Our faith needs to be strengthened, and it can only be strengthened through prayer and fasting.